Hi, everyone. Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. As many of you know, in 2014, I wrote the B Corp Handbook, How You Can Use Business as a Force for Good. I'm excited to announce that the completely revised and updated second edition of the B Corp Handbook is launching this year on April 23rd, 2019. I co-authored the new version of the book with Dr. Tiffany Jana, an internationally recognized expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. The book now provides guidance on how to dramatically enhance your company's social and environmental impact while ensuring that you center equity at every step. So please order your copy today by visiting lifteconomy.com slash book. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash book. Thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. I'm your host, Andrew Baskin. The goal of this interview series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, democratic, diverse, transparent, and whole systems approach to using business as a force for good. What I would advise anybody starting a company, I would really spend a long time figuring out what we stood for, what our community was, what kind of relationship we wanted to have with our customers, understand that our products would always be related to that community and to that message and to that purpose. And then I think that marketing is easy. Since we're talking about strategy, that's where I think marketing relates back to business strategy, that what you want to do with your marketing is you want to be building the company that you want to be in 10 years, but you also want that message, that original message to be able to build on it and to grow it over time. You don't want to be changing it around every six months, every year, because it's it takes a long time to establish those kinds of relationships with customers and in the larger world. And you want people to trust you. And if you want to build that trust, that story has to be the same from the beginning. This is our third episode in a series featuring Patagonia's Vincent Stanley, where we explore Patagonia's vision, culture, strategy, and operations. Topics we'll be covering in much greater detail in our upcoming Next Economy MBA. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out lifteconomy.com slash MBA. Right now, you get 40% off if you sign up before May 15th, plus an additional 15% off with the promo code hashtag next economy now. Feel free to tweet that out. So our past interview with Vincent Stanley, along with other leaders at Patagonia, including Rose Marcario, Rick Ridgway, and Phil Graves, rank as our most popular episodes. And many folks have reached out to us because they want to know more of the story behind some of the business aspects of Patagonia, in particular, their vision, culture, strategy, and operations. Hence the name Patagonia Mini MBA. In the last episode, we touched on culture, and today, my business partner, Ryan Honeyman, will be talking with Vincent Stanley about Patagonia's strategy. One last note before we drop into that discussion, we've kept a pretty consistent format of the show for some time, and I just want to give folks a heads up that I plan to continually iterate on the format of the show in the weeks and months to come based on your feedback. So any and all input is welcome and encouraged, as we really want to honor our relationship with our listeners and craft a show that's truly valuable for you. I really want each of you to think about this podcast as a two-way conversation. Your critical feedback is as welcome and encouraged as is creative feedback on how we can make the show more awesome or even fun testimonials about what you love about the show that we can share on the show. You can always email me at andrew at lifteconomy.com. So without further ado, please enjoy Ryan Honeyman's conversation with Vincent Stanley. All right, Vincent, we're back again to talk about strategy. So on the strategy side, marketing is one of the subsections and Can you talk a little bit about, you know, marketing and the approach at Patagonia and, you know, maybe even from the, I know that you haven't done marketing or or like maybe how was marketing even approached in the early days of Patagonia and and sort of like maybe a little progression of how it's evolved over time? Yeah, I I think we've always had an ambivalent attitude toward toward marketing. And uh, part of it comes out of the ease with which we we're able to tell our original story because it really did grow out of evolve climbing. It grew out of the sort of the golden Yosemite age, um, the reputation of Chouinard equipment. And then we were this tiny little company, but we were well known and well regarded within the outdoor industry. So when we introduced Patagonia clothes, people already thought it was kind of a, within our industry, thought it was kind of a cool idea and they wanted to, they wanted to buy from us. Um, we, Kept. I mean, I think it was very hard when you when you start out as a as a climbing equipment company. There's no question of good, better, best. You're making the very best gear you can make that will perform at a high level and last for a long time because your customers' lives depend on on that. And when we got into clothing, I think that was a habit that was a bit hard to get rid of. So 
even though we knew we didn't have to be as rigorous, that habit stayed with us. And so the marketing, we, we from climbing, we, 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 the, that world was so small that we were selling to friends, friends of friends, or friends of friends of friends, maybe three degrees of separation. So we knew we could always strike the right tone because we were, we didn't have to work at it. We, we knew who our customers were. And and we knew how to talk to them just the way you would talk to a friend. And when we got into the clothing business, we really took the same approach. Um, We treated the cut. We we kind of considered ourselves as as the as the primary customer, and um, that we could speak to the broader customer the way we would speak to each other. So that was kind of the basis of marketing. Um, And I think that also because we came out of climbing and because we started giving 1% of sales to environmental organizations. The environmental story, our commitment to saving wild places or to supporting grassroots activists, that was part of the, that was part and parcel of the message from the, from the beginning. Um, and also being, uh, there was something that my, um, I, I was responsible for the original company voice. And then uh, my wife came in and around 19, 19- 84, and she was the primary catalog editor. And what she brought to the table was her experience as a journalist. And also added to that voice is kind of um, telling the whole story, but not but not a not an advertising story. When we described the products, we talked about how they were made, what they were for. But at the same time, it was a fairly light touch. Uh, um, there was often humor involved, or there were good tales about how the products were used. When I talk to when I talk to younger people now, and I, and I don't know, I think it may be that my experience is so limited, having worked at Patagonia, that I've developed this theory of marketing that may or may not be of use to anybody else. But I think it's true that if, if what I would advise anybody starting a company, or if I were starting a company of my own. I would really spend a long time figuring out what we stood for, what our community was, how we, what kind of relationship we wanted to have with our customers, understand that our products would always be related to that community and to that message and to that purpose. Um, and then I think that marketing is easy because you're not having to cre- recreate a story every 18 months or two years. You're not trying to um, you're not trying to pitch yourself, and you're not trying to uh, create a particular angle that some people are going to respond to and others are not going to respond to. I also think it creates since we're talking about strategy, that's where I think marketing relates back to business strategy. That what you want to do with your marketing is you want to create you want to be building the company that you want to be in ten years. But you also want that message, that original message, to be able to build on it and to grow it over time. You don't want to be switch changing it around every six months, every year, because it's it takes a long time to establish those kinds of relationships with customers and in the larger world. And you want people to trust you. And if you want to build that trust, that story has to be the same from the beginning. And, you know, the some of the avenues that you've taken with marketing, you know, like, for example, the the documentaries and like Unbroken Ground. Can you talk about when the company decided to get into sort of full feature length stuff as opposed to maybe like ads and magazines or et cetera? Yeah. You know, we were never very big on advertising. We always, the the only ads we ever ran were in what were called vertical publications for the different sport communities that were involved with climbing, surfing, fly fishing skiing, et cetera. And, um, but the movies, um, the, the first full length movie we were involved with was 180 South. And um, that was an interesting project because we had just really started in the, in the surf business and we were involved with the Malloy brothers. And that was a, a film made by Chris Malloy that really sort of, um, that film reflected the sense of adventure, uh, a real adventure that we tend to identify with in the communities we serve. For instance, in climbing, we're very much, um, we advocate uh, light and clean and 
the style of climbing. We, we're, we're not involved in major exp expeditions with uh, lots and lots of helicopters and sat phones and all that. We, we admire small groups of friends who are going out and doing really difficult climbs in remote places. And the same for, you know, fly fishing and or skiing, where we're, we're involved more with with people who really work uh, work hard to uh, go do the uphill on a, in a remote place and then earn the reward going downhill. So that's that's one thing that you can convey in films. It's that is easier to convey in films than in words. That that feeling of a particular sport. The first sort of advocacy film we made that was. Um, um, feature length was um, about the dams, and that was a great film. And I think, that, yeah, thank you. And and that was it was a very difficult film to make. But there were there were I thought there were two interesting things about that film. One is we what we we went in we went into a um, a climate the 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 hydropower even on the environmental side was considered a good thing uh, because it's a renewable energy, and so we were fighting this image of hydro of hydropower as necessarily an environmental source of energy. And at the same time, in order to 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 show a countervailing value to having dams every uh, uh, few hundred feet on a river, you really have to show what the life of the river is, what the the, the what kind of the wild quality of the of the water that's irreplaceable once you chain it with a system of dams and, and reservoirs. And I thought that the film really conveyed the life of the river uh, very well. And that's really, that's really hard to do. So when we're doing film, we, you know, we're involved in a lot of films since you mentioned Unbroken Ground. Um, I, I, I think the value of film is that you can, if it's done well, you can convey um, an emotional, uh, almost a uh, spiritual experience it's much harder to convey it than on, in an essay or in a book. Um, and you can do, if you do it right, you can you can do advocacy that is more persuasive, I think, than um, than an ordinary uh, ordinary essay. Yeah. In the the Patagonia album, the mixtape that you're putting out. No, I'm just kidding. There's not one of those, not one of those yet. There. Yeah, there was. There was a brief mixtape, by the oh, way. Really? There was a, we we did have a Patagonia music program uh, very briefly um, in oh I don't know two thousand five or six or something like that for about eighteen months. And we had some great musicians, and but it, it didn't uh, it didn't survive. Yeah, that's it's in the lost archives somewhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of a brand community with marketing how do you cultivate how do you cultivate that and how do you think about getting folks to sort of you know i think there's some inherent parts of patagonia that sort of creates a community but there's there's probably intentional things that you all do if you could speak to that at all yeah and i and i i think again go back to climbing so that we have um and many companies have ambas brand ambassadors, um, and those companies hire people that will reflect um, on the brand that you you want to be you want cus potential customers to see uh, your label on their chest. But I think the difference with Patagonia is we're not looking for the most famous people, but we're looking for the people who are most closely identified with what we stand for in a particular sport. So Steve House in, in climbing really exemplifies this uh, light and fast uh, light and fast climbing style. Um, the surfers that we use are, you know, we're the bulk of the clothing market for surfers aims at a at a fifteen to seventeen year old. We're we're really are we're aiming at at surfers who are older, who are more soul surfers rather than uh, competitive. Um, the same in skiing um, and in, in fly fishing. So in order to create a community, you want to be known uh, where, you know, for in the areas in which people are doing the sport in a way that you support and you believe in and that you design for. And you also want to have relationships with 
uh, the people who are most enthusiastic about working for Patagonia because of its values, um, not because we offer um, uh, the best uh, the best sponsorship package. Um, so those two things, both people and communities, there are certain places where that kind of gravitate toward um, uh, Jackson, Wyoming is an important uh, spot for us. Uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest has always had more Patagonia customers than, than normal because it's both uh, you have weather, you have available mountains, and you have um, communities that are really into the outdoors. Same with the Bay Area. Uh, the other way in which we build brand community is through environmentalism. And what we especially try to do with the stores in the last 10 years is to make those feel like hubs, both for the sports that we're involved in, but also for the grassroots environmental organizations. We have lots of events um, every month at every store. Um, and we, you know, we keep our customers aware. We keep them, we, we offer opportunities for people to uh, meet the environmental organizations that are working to save a local forest or keep a river open, et cetera. So it's all, you know, it's all pretty hard work. It's all, um, this isn't algorithm work. This is, uh, this is relationship building um, with people in specific communities. For, for example, the, uh, the Trump, um, the, my president, the president stole your land uh, blackout mm -hmm. of the. Can you talk about right. the, what went into that, and was there any like fretting about whether that would destroy your business? I mean, like obviously it wouldn't destroy it, but like, what what were some of the conversations internally that like, and then like, how did you come to that decision to have that page? Uh, um, I'm not sure that I wasn't involved with the with uh, setting up that page, um, but I think we knew we would get overall that we you know that the response would be positive. Um, and we, we knew that it was direct enough that we would alienate um, some folks. Um, but also, you know, for the kind of community we're serving, which are, we, we, we want our customers, or we, we're, in, we're in business um, to, for people who want to experience uh, wildness in wild places. Um, and we're committed to their survival. So it's kind of a no-brainer for us to take a position on that. Um, we're, it's interesting, Salt Lake City, we have a store, we have an outlet, and I think that we have, uh, we had really positive response um, to that in Salt Lake um, among the people who would form our, our natural community. And then, of course, we had negative response from the uh, commissioners of San Juan County <laughs> who had uh, petitioned to have uh, Bears Ears uh, monumental status re rescinded. Yeah. It's it's sort of like you're you know that you'll lose some folks, uh, but um, it's almost like the publicity that you got from that dramatically outweighs it. And it's not it's funny because some people would say that's just virtue. Like I've seen comments on um, Rose's uh, post about say donating the ten million you got from the tax uh -huh. the, you know the tax cuts to uh, you know the one percent or or to non environmental nonprofits is. It's just nothing but virtue signaling to like, you know, basically increase profit profits. Um, do you speak at all about like, I, I know that's not true, but, <laughs> but I mean, like, how, how do you all think about that kind of critique? Well, it's interesting. It, since, since, since we're talking about strategy, <laughs> the, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you an earlier story that's kind of interesting. In the, in the early 90s, we published in a catalog all of the organizations that we supported, and it was before we did a booklet that talks about uh, that, an annual booklet called Environmental Initiatives that talks about every grantee. Um, and we supported some, some controversial organizations back in the early 90s, including Earth First, which was considered by some an eco terrorist group. But the one that got us in trouble was support for Planned Parenthood. Um, and we supported Planned Parenthood for its work on population control, which we considered important to environmentalism. And so we got boycotted by Southern churches. Uh, there was a movement and um, they, flooded, they flooded our call center um, uh, in order to prevent us from doing business. So we, we would get these calls every 
couple of minutes from people saying they weren't going to buy from us anymore. They were actually our customers. So finally, the fellow who was in charge of our community relations at the time uh, came up with a strategy so that whenever anybody called, we would say, thank you so much for calling. We're so glad to hear from you. And we want you to know that for every call like this we receive, we're going to give an additional $5 to Planned Parenthood. And um, that's a great idea. <laughs> so that 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 stopped the calls. Um, and I think that what you, you need to you need to stand for what you stand for. Um, and most of what you stand for has to be positive. I mean, it's, it's not our message is not that President Trump is a is a bad guy. Our our message is in favor of the things that we want to see more of in this world. Our message is that the we're in real trouble with the way we're treating the natural world and natural systems, and that we really have to change the way we operate as human beings in order to uh, live in partnership with nature and not as a dominator because it's not work it's certainly not working anymore. You have to stand what you stand for, and when you stand for something, you're also going to be standing against something else. And in the process that people think we're cynical, you know, we, we just have to live with that. When we ran the Don't Buy This Jacket ad, I got all, first of all, everybody thought it was a campaign. Everybody referred to it as a campaign. It was an ad we took out once on Black Friday in the New York Times and never ran again. Um, people said, oh, this was brilliant marketing um, and that our sales increased, et cetera, et cetera. Our sales did increase that year. But also before we ran that ad, it took a vote of the board of directors um, because we were afraid that that ad might hurt our business um, on the most valuable day of the year and in the most valuable season to our business as well as to any uh, consumer retail business. So when 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 we undertake these actions, it's it's sometimes with trepidation. Increasingly, we have we have more and more experience doing this, and and we know that we will have some uh, positive response. But it also turns out that when we often, is evil sort of laughs and says, you know, whenever I, I do the right thing, I make, I make money. Um, when in, in 2016, when for Black Friday, we decided to give 100% of revenue, not profits, but revenue taken in that day to environmental organizations, the response was really overwhelming. We, we, fifty percent of the customers were new customers. Now, if I were the uh, chief marketing officer of any company, I would know that the cost of obtaining new customers, particularly at full retail, is extraordinary. And, and so, I would say yes. That's in a, kind of an amazing way to uh, uh, to get new to get new customers and to get them in the right way but that certainly is not the intention it was that was a byproduct I think of doing the right thing and it uh, and not a cynical ploy in order to to grow the business yeah how do you decide um, you know what in relation to sort of the, uh, the, the sort of sales, um, upsides. Have you had any sales sort of like, we're going to take a stand on this and it sort of did a belly flop or face plant or anything like that? Any, anything that didn't work like you'd hoped? No, I can't, I can't think of one. Yeah. You know, I can think of, I can think of stances that we've taken that have, that have resulted in controversy that has not been a benefit to the company. Um, but nothing that was a, was, um, I can't think of something something along those lines where where we had a real uh, backlash and withdrew. Yeah, it's probably because you make wise decisions. <laughs> you don't just go well, supporting whatever. Well, no, I, I mean I think and I and I think that we've been very consistent. So we're not, you know, when when we make stands, we're 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 talking about um, we're increasingly talking about climate, but we we also most of what we talk about is. We, we know very personally what we're talking about. We know an awful lot about the supply chain for the apparel industry. Um, we know a lot about um, the wilderness. Uh, we know a lot about um, uh, the, the, the climate change and those challenges right now. 
we're not kind of looking at a menu of causes to support or not support. And we're giving, give, we're telling the same message pretty consistently over time. So, you know, Gillette just came out with a, an ad talking about toxic masculinity. And my, my response to that, when I saw that, I thought, well, you know, that's fine. But my question is, are they going to be talking about toxic masculinity five years from now? Is this something that really does represent the core business and the core values of the people involved in that business? And if it doesn't, it's, you know, it's in the long run, it's not going to do them that much good because they'll be back to talking about how close their blades shave um, or uh, maybe picking up some other issue. Um, so I think it's really important that if you have values that they really be related to the community that holds those values to, and that they reflect what your customers care about and they reflect what your product is about. And if it doesn't, then I think it's harder. I question. I mean, I think it's great if you're going to be consistent and you're going to build your business around uh, around doing good for for a ten year period. But the sixty day wonders for an advertising campaign, I I think that that's going to be a fad that will be gone pretty soon. Yeah, I remember there was some video of Yvonne, Yvonne talking at a conference several years ago, and there was people there from like American Airlines and where you know just coca-cola and someone asked him you know how do you how do you be such be so authentic and like and and i think he was like you just like actually it was something along the lines of um or or like how do we get to like be as authentic as patagonia and he's and, and he's like you're basically he basically was like it's because you're all bullshit and like you're not actually authentic <laughs> he basically <laughs> was like yeah, he was like, if you actually want to be authentic, then do it. Like, don't like ask me a question yeah. about how to like market yourselves as authentic. Right. Yeah, that was right. really funny and powerful. Yeah. And, and so again, if we're talking about people starting out in business and B Corps, that it's essential that you start out. What is, what is authentic about your business? What is it authentic about what you're, what you're doing? What's, what do you really care about? Um, what are you going to care about also in 10 years? It's going to keep you going. Go down the long road, um, and you, if you stay true to that, um, that's a good business model because you build your business around that. That also creates um, when you communicate that, that creates a kind of strategic discipline. That when you start to stray outside that core message and that core purpose, you will you'll get feedback from your community. You'll get you'll uh, you'll also in, you'll have that internal discipline where you won't want to break faith with your customers and with the public at large because you stood for something for um, for as long as you've been in business. Yeah, and I mean, let's be honest. It's uh, I mean, if Patagonia was publicly traded, it's I don't think Yvonne could even maintain the authenticity because he'd have dual sort of uh, you know duties. He'd be looking after shareholders and looking after like the sort of other stakeholders. So it's, I mean, I know that benefit corp and, and like, I'm a big advocate of the B Corp movement. I, I still think that I'm still, this is kind of a little bit off topic, but I'm still like skeptical that any publicly traded company can ever be like deeply beneficial. It can, it can only sort of like mod mm -hmm. be modified from terrible capitalism, but I'm not sure it can ever be deeply beneficial and regenerative. I don't know. Do you, do you share that view or do you feel like it's maybe it is possible for a public company to do that? Well, I think I think it is possible in the long run, but I think that the privately held companies are going to lead the way. Um, you know, you've really got two publicly held companies right now who are very interesting, and that would be Unilever and Danone. Um, and both are involved in the B Corp movement, and Danone would like to have be a B Corp as a whole company, which is I think twenty six billion euro company, and and whether now, its major businesses are water and yogurt and, and baby food. And, um, you know, whether all of those businesses are, how, how, and how you consider them beneficial, I, I think is, a little, is, is up for grabs. But they're serious. Um, and they do, you know, the, the, the CEO of the company is serious and also people all down the line the, and the millennials coming in to work for the company, they do want to create a company which is much more responsible and I'm not sure 
regenerate it would be a, meet a regenerative standard, but they want to do the right thing. And these things, <clears throat> so my question is, in 2030, will you have some publicly traded companies that might be considered regenerative or might in their own time be as advanced in Patagonia is now, say? And I think it's possible, but I think it will, it will take a lot of development and it will take a very different attitude toward profit. It's not, it's, it, it's not that the companies are publicly traded, it's that they, they're operating on short term with short term values and short term pressures. And, and that makes it impossible, um, makes it very, very difficult or impossible to be. Um, to work for the good of the community or the good of nature. So Yvonne's not demanding quarterly increases in share price and <laughs> quarterly <laughs> quarterly returns. Yeah, yeah no. no. Yeah. And um, he, you know, Paul Pullman at Unilever said he wouldn't he he wouldn't focus on the quarter. I'm sure known as not. And I think in business as a whole, you're you're well, I hope this is true, and I, I think it's true, is that you're gradually moving away from the unshakable conviction that people had for 40 years in Milton Friedman's idea of the privacy of, of um, shareholder value and, and um, return on, it, on equity. I, I think that that's, I, I, th- I think that that has created this myopic perspective on what the health of a business is that makes it difficult for a business to be healthy in the long run. And you're even seeing that, the, you know, the prime, the big, Friedman-esque example was General Electric, and 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 you're seeing a kind of breakdown of the company that has operated uh, most successfully along those those principles in a time of climate change and a time of big social up- upheaval. I think that we're going to be having for the next 20 or 30 years. I, I, I think it's just an illusion that you can uh, pretend your business is not part of the larger world. Yeah, you know one one of the things that uh, that Patagonia um, is known for is like, you know, making high quality um, responsibly made. So, you know, often if it's cotton, it's organic and other, you know, fibers, et cetera, are, are sourced as responsible as possible. And, and so how do you balance like the, um, the sort of maximum value to the say workers uh, um, who, sort of stitch the clothes and then you know, like the suppliers with also like what the consumer is willing to pay. Cause you know, we were joking about the uh, $35 boxers, <laughs> but yeah, you know, and so like at what point, if it's a $40 pair of boxers, no one buys it or something like how, how do you sort of balance the sort of responsibility piece uh, versus like consumer demand for like low prices? Um, that, that, that's kind of a, a a tough one, and it, it's certainly more of an art than a science. Uh, um, and, w- and one of the one of the problems, clothing is way too cheap. I mean, clothing is cheaper than it was in the 1970s, and the reason it's cheaper is is because it's made cheaper on the backs of the workers and on the backs of the environment, or on the back of the health of the environment. Um, so when we're looking at making a pair of boxers, or if we're looking at making a rain jacket. There are other boxers in the world, and there are other rain jackets in the world, and, and there's a uh, an idea in the consumer's mind of of what they'll pay, but that often can be more flexible than 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 people allow. I mean, I certainly when I was uh, when I used to set the prices at Patagonia in the in the 80s and the 90s, I would you know certainly worry about breaking a threshold which nobody would buy my product. And then I would look at an ad in the New York Sunday Times for, you know, an Angora sweater for $1,300 and think, oh my God, what, what am I worried about? Um, <laughs> because there's a, um, that, sense of, that sense of value can uh, change depending on what the person thinks they're paying for and what they're willing to pay for so one of the things I think is important for a company, for Patagonia and for companies that are, are doing good work in their supply chain is you really have to kind of let people know what, what you're doing, what you've got in that $35 pair of boxers, is you, if that is indeed the price. I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't looked it up. Um, we've got organic cotton. Um, I'm not sure if the boxers are fair trade certified labor, but um, about half the line is these days. 
um, you're getting what you're also paying for as a customer is the uh, the care with which that product is made, and also the fact that it will last a long time. So it's a, it's kind of a it's a delicate balance. On the one hand, you don't want to price yourself out of the market. On the other hand, you want to kind of redefine um, what it is people are paying for, because I think people don't think about that. They just think, okay, uh, twenty dollars for a t-shirt. Uh, that's because that's what I see uh, in most of the places I shop. Or they think I'm going to spend five hundred dollars for a t-shirt because it's high fashion um, and it's going to get me into the club on Saturday night. Or they think I'm going to, you know, pay thirty dollars for a t-shirt because it's organic cotton. And it's going to last a long time and the elastic won't wear out as fast as other brands. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so for for Patagonia, we talked about this before, like the eighty twenty or you know profitability piece. Is there are there, do you sort of make more money on like the highly technical items, like the really high end, like snowboard jacket, or is it more that the profits come and just say like socks and underwear and shirts that's got like a, a good margin or how, how does it play out for? Yeah. Patagonia? Well, it varies. I think it's harder to make money on the highly technical items because you, first of all, they're much more, they're more difficult to make. There's, um, um, the development is more expensive. Um, where you make a lot of money is in the products that sell a lot. I mean, it's just kind of traditional business sense of cash cows. So if we have a product on the line for um, several years, the the, the redesign, uh, the, the amount of money that we put into making that product diminishes over time because we get more efficient at making it and um, doesn't require a lot of uh, R&D and um, customers are buying it. Those those products tend not to be the most beloved within the company because they're we're you know it's like okay yeah we've done that years ago, but it's still bringing in dividends and it's bringing in profits. Uh, the eighty twenty rule just seems, in my experience, just works for anything. You know, twenty eighty percent of your sales are going to come from twenty percent of your products. You know, um, you can name any kind of business function and it will work out that way. You can't ignore. Um, that doesn't mean that you concentrate all your energy into that 20% because the eye is always going to be, it's always going to shift. It's always going to be 20%, 80% of something. And, and if you want your, your business to be healthy, you have to look at the whole thing. How do you think about competitors? You know, do you say, uh, okay, our, our um, North Face is putting out this gear this year and, you know, so we should have something that matches that or, or are you guys just kind of, off on your own, just like, we, we don't care what competitors are doing. We just build what our customers want. Or how, how do you think about that in, in your business? You know, I, I think the most, for us, the most important thing to, that we, we talked earlier on about building the brand community. So the most important thing is, are we building um, for products for the uses, are we building the right product for its intended use? And are we, is our, does that intended use reflect the company's values. It's also true that if we go to, if we take the line around to our largest customers, they're going to say, oh, why can't you make a such and such? And they'll be saying that because they're selling um, something like that from somebody else. Or like, and, and it could go down to the simplest level. You know, we just really sell, sell that in blue or we sell that in yellow. And the problem with that is that you used to be a sales manager is that by the time I, I got yellow stand-up shorts into the line, uh, the market would have moved on. Um, following, following the market is not in, in apparel is, uh, unless you're, you're, in a fashion, you're in the fashion world and you can respond very quickly. It's not usually, not usually sound business sense. Um, so we try to uh, pretty much develop our line in, internally. Well, we also, we're, you know, we, we, we stay well abreast of what our, customers, what our competitors are doing. We, we look at other things going on in the world. We subscribe to uh, you know, companies that tell us what the color trends are. Um, our designers take inspiration trips to, to different places to pick up ideas. We've created an archives um, at Patagonia of our, um, a lot of the clothing from 19... 19- 75 onwards 
and our designers can often look to things that we've done in the past for inspiration. So again, this is art and not, not science, but in, in general, there's always the temptation to uh, follow, um, to come out with, if, if somebody has something hot, to come out with your own version of that. But usually it doesn't work out too well. And it's much better to um, stick to your own lane. You've, you've been a part of the sales side. And, you know, I don't imagine online was really, did that overlap um, when you were head of sales? Was there a huge online no. presence or still catalog? No. No, we had started with the cat. Yeah, we had the catalog business, and we had just we had started in the retail. But I haven't I haven't been involved in the sales side since 1992, and ecom really started to come on in the, in the late 90s. I was peripherally involved with that because I helped develop Footprint Chronicles, and so I know the folks involved in that very well. But but that was that was uh, um, not something I was directly involved in. Yeah, because I'm just wondering how with you know, Amazon and just, you know, I think 50% of the internet searches start on Amazon now, like how, how the company, how you all think about, uh, you know, whether it's your own site versus REI or Patagonia stores, or I guess, third party online. Yeah. How do you sort of prioritize those? Well, it's interesting. When we did start out, I think we were the only company our size that was involved in uh, mail order uh, retail and wholesale. That that was very rare in the 70s. And um, I think it was along these lines when that if you, that wholesale was really, and, and that's always been a very strong part of the business, is it's really critical for reaching especially new customers and or, uh, people who have just started to climb or people who have just started to um, surf or to fly fish. And they're shopping in a particular store that serves that community where they where they live, and, and you want Patagonia to be there. Um, and often Patagonia is a second purchase. Uh, people will buy something uh, cheaper or have it fall apart, and then they'll say, "Okay, well now I'm going to I'm going to invest in something that will last." And then we always had a catalog, and we loved the catalog because we could tell the whole story, you know, and we could tell it in our own voice. It wasn't um, on the retail floor next to competitors items and we love having the store because it's you can everything is out there in three dimensions and also you can have a kind of face-to-face -face relationship with a customer that's irreplaceable um, either in the wholesale or in the catalog business and really e-commerce is an extension of of the catalog business because you can tell the whole story so it's different structurally it's like uh, you know the catalog is you tell the whole story between two covers and the um, and e-commerce is more like you know the house of many mansions. You never know which window or door the customer is going to come through, and how many rooms they're going to be in before they leave. But the the overall strategy of the company, I think, has been to have as strong a business as possible uh, in the direct business, both with stores and with uh, and with e-com, um, because because we can have the strongest relationship with the customer that is not uh, filtered or, or, or diluted, but it's still essential to be in the wholesale business. So that's, you know, strategically, that's the, the reason we're involved in. Interesting. You know, so it's more about like new customer acquisition almost on the wholesale side. Yeah. And also serving people where they live and where they shop, you right. know, they have good relationships. And we were very careful about distribution. I mean, if you look at our distribution versus, any other major supplier in the outdoor industry, it's much, much smaller. Um, it's very tight. Uh, we really want to have a, a strong relationship with the people on the floor in the place, even at the, at the dealer basis. So, um, yeah, and that's true all over the world. It's true in Japan and Europe too. Well, let's shift a little bit to like the broader, this broader shift, um, where Patagonia became Patagonia Works, I think in like 2013 or something around there. Mm -hmm. And you shifted into Patagonia Provisions, Tensha Adventures, Patagonia Inc. Uh, I think, you know, Fletcher showing our surfboards and maybe one other one. <laughs> I don't know. Is there another one? That that's, uh, I think that's a, those are the main ones. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe um, Yvonne's uh, Seaweed Bar and Grill or something like that. Yeah, there may, <laughs> there may be. 
stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. I know he's really interested in seaweed right now. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, can you talk about that shift and like sort of the reasoning behind that? And then maybe we could dip into like a few of those different, uh, uh, sort of sub the sort of entities that came out of Patagonia works. Yeah. You know, I'd like to say that there's kind of some grand strategic vision for <laughs> the which we get into these businesses. But, um, you know, the way Yvonne describes it is he works in business as he does as a climber, which is to, to take one step or a couple of steps. And, and if it feels right and it's working out, then to take the next one. Um, I think he always wanted to be in the food business. Um, and so we had the opportunity well, I think a few years ago. We got serious about it about five years ago, um, and it, we're we're mu- in a mu- much better position now, I think, to to behave seriously in the food business because we're really um, increasingly every product we make, we're we make it with an eye to uh, changing the supply chain, to changing the, the way that product is made and the way it comes to market, and to solving uh, problems related to agriculture with that product. So it's a really good proving ground for us. And Tinshed Tinch Ventures is similar. Um, we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to invest in companies that whose values r- reflect our own. And we're also, we're looking at strong social and environmental purpose. So they're, they're in energy or their food or uh, water uh, uh, or they're in our supply chain. And um, so we have an investment in a company that figured out a way to uh, clean down without water. Well, that's, you can imagine the amount of down clothing that we produce and the amount of water we would use in cleaning the down that goes into those jackets or sweaters. It's, a, you know, th- th- this is um, uh, a big environmental move and it's also, um, uh, it makes sense from every, from every point of view. Um, we have an investment in uh, Boreo skateboards, which makes uh, skateboard decks out of recovered, what they call ghost fishing nets, and, uh, polypropylene or plastic fishing nets that have been discarded from boats. And we, we, uh, we have uh, people in the Chilean coast who are harvesting them and taking them to recycling centers. And then those are, those are made into skateboard decks. What's, what that does for the company for Patagonia as a whole is it kind of takes takes away the blinders of having been in the apparel business for 50 years, we're, or 45 years, we're, we're looking at a number of other businesses and we're, we're, we're learning um, um, uh, uh, in ways to teach us how to operate also at Patagonia. Um, so I think that that tin shed and provisions are, are, are the two of the most exciting ventures that we've, pursue uh, over the last few years and they will really help uh, define the company's future so if we maybe we'll talk about ten shed and then we talk about provisions so ten shed you know i've uh i think one of the first interviews we did in this podcast with, with phil graves but um uh-huh. that's back when it was uh like it was like 10 million and change or 1 million and change yeah, yeah tw- 20 million 20 million and change yeah and change yeah and then we were joking it's we're like a hundred million and change now, and then just change the name because <laughs> we're going up. Yeah. But um, yeah, one of the things that I think people don't appreciate necessarily or don't know is how there's a- exit and liquidity, uh, how much different Ten Shed is. And could you maybe talk a little bit about how how Ten Shed invests and how that's different than other sort of venture capital or other types of private equity investors? Yeah, um, I think. It's- I think it's different in, in, in several ways. One, one is uh, even, even investors in, um, who might be known as impact in, investors, for the most part, have, fairly, have a fairly conventional term sheet. And they're, they're coming in and they're saying, okay, we're, we're going to support this business um, that isn't doing anything wrong or maybe doing some things that are good. Um, but we want we want a 20% return and we want out in five years. And um, the, the problem with that is the pressure it puts on a, on a business to return that money to its investors rather than build the best possible business. 
So when we go in, we don't we don't have an exit strategy. We're also working very closely. Our, our, you know, the, the biggest thing we need to know is is we need to have confidence in the management, um, and we need to have confidence in the venture. So um, we like what somebody is doing, and we think that they're capable of doing it. And those that's kind of the traditional way in which people invested. That was the traditional way that community banks lent. Um, but it's a far cry from um, figuring out, you know, you can't do that with algorithms. Um, again, this is a kind of retail approach to investing, but it's working out for us. You know, we're, we're, we, we, we're making a good return. Um, and we think we're supporting some businesses that are um, going to do some real good in the world. And on the, provision side um you know the that that's been out for at least two or three years now right uh, i seem to remember yeah more m- more than that oh wow and uh, yeah uh, but i think it's really sort of taken hold in the in the, in the past uh, couple of years and i think we've sort of quintupled sales uh, in the last few years it's still very small um, but we've and we've got a very we've got a stronger product line etc we really started with salmon in retort packages that were being harvested uh, from fish returning to their natal waters and caught by uh, local tribes people. So it's a great, you know, it was, it was a great way to provide that food, but it was a very, it was like one or two products that we started with and now we're starting to, to, to expand. Yes. But the, you know, the great thing about the, for us, so if you look at, um, it's interesting if you look at Drawdown by Paul Hawken and, and you look at the hundred hundred or so ways in which we can uh, take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the ground, um, there are some surprises. I think they expected electric cars would be like you know number three or four or something, and it's down to thirty. Um, there's surprises because women and uh, equal rights for women and women and girls' education is like number seven in terms of. Uh, uh, contribution to uh, um, serious mitigation of climate change. But if you look at, there are, there are four or five things that turn out to be number one in terms of regenerative agriculture. That if you bring the soil back to health, um, that the potential for uh, sequestering carbon is so great. So we're, you know, this is something that we've, we, we really believe in and we've you know, teamed with Rodale and we've teamed with uh, Dr. Bronner's to come up with a new regenerative organic uh, certification, which is now in the in the test phase with about uh, twenty different uh, twenty different farms, um, and that is really important to us. And, and 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 so when we build up this business, we want to bring it, we want to build it along regenerative lines. We're not really interested in following a leader. We're really interested in helping to develop. Um, an agriculture that's going to be good for nature rather than extractive. Yeah, can you talk about more about the regenerative organic standard and you know all the different things that that takes in and like what kind of maybe products or what what sort of the next couple of years look like for that standard? Yeah, well, we're, I think the test phase, the first test phase, will be done in um, um, this summer, and we've already we've got uh, an SF is a, um, a very good certification board. So they will, they will do the work. Um, the standard is, is, is Rodale helped establish certified organic standard with USDA um, 20 or 30 years ago. And one of the things that they were frustrated by is they had always intended that the, the organic standard should be something uh, subject to continuous improvement. It's not something that you just say, okay, this is what, what organic is, and uh, that's that. Um, because as you, the, the more you do over time, the more you, the more you discover uh, about what will work and what will work better. So they were interested from the beginning in the issue of soil health. And right now, the, the organic standard, does, all it means is, is that you're not using chemicals um, on the land. You're not using, or you're not using the chemicals that are, synthetic chemicals that are, um, uh, forbidden to be used, and but it doesn't really look at at positive soil health. And positive soil health depends also on a number of other things. Is it a monoculture or are you companion planting? 
Um, are you uh, 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 tillage is uh, not a part of the organic standard, and, and it's well known that if you're if you're over tilling, you're you're basically taking more out of the soil than you can put back in. Um, so soil health is is a major element, but they're also looking at the the health of um, the look at this and say, you know, you can't really talk about this without talking about the health of the workers and the communities. So there's a labor standard involved as well as um, as as uh, soil health. So it's a more holistic look at everything that is involved in um, growing a plant that's going to become either fruit or fiber um, than we've had before. And I think partnered with like Dr. Bronner's and a few other folks. Yeah. Is that right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The I think you know Rodale's been pushing this since the '40s. Um, Dr. Bronner's is a wonderful company that um, we're very impressed by uh, everything that they have, uh, everything that they do in their supply chain. They really know where their stuff is coming from and what the and what the processes are, and they're very um, uh, comprehensive uh, in their approach. We're also a little jealous because they're beast. The B Corp score is higher than ours. I know. <laughs> you guys are already top <laughs> top thirty, I think. So, so especially for large. It, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny how that works. Because because I wouldn't say seriously that we're going to be competing for higher B Corp scores with anybody. But that's human nature. You just you just look at that and you say, oh, I I want to be that high too. I want to be I want to beat that score. Yeah. So how do you you know one of the challenges. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if it's different for clothing and food, but as you scale up the food side, um, you know, is it possible to remain incredibly regenerative uh, or, is, or are there inevitably some compromises in order to meet the demand? You know, how do you, because I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, and like maybe how does that compare to, to clothing? Well, it's interesting because with cloth- clothing is pretty much not regenerative. I mean, we're, we're basically doing less harm or we're we're being conscientious about reducing the harm we do from season to season but with um, food we've got the potential to actually be regenerative and i i think it's kind of up to us to uh make sure that whatever we do that as you scale that um continue to be regenerative and it's also complicated i mean what we're making is essentially we're making prepared foods and the we're using ingredients. I think the big questions for organic agriculture is the grains and the vegetables um, that are going to go into the foods that we're making. That those ingredients are going to be um, the the major and the major story about what we're what we're doing with regenerative agriculture. So the the idea, if you say we're growing, the the, the only way in which we would not be regenerative is if we reduced our standards for the ingredients right yeah i guess it would just be like i'm thinking like buffalo like how many regenerative mm. buffalo can you really provide at a certain scale yeah you know you know that's a great yeah that, well, that's a great question so what you would um you don't want to build a business that's going to out out outstrip your ability to to source and when you're dealing with meat you're you're you are dealing I think we're dealing with a market that will grow smaller over time and more and more specialized. Yeah. Well, as we move into the last uh, few questions here, um, you know, one of the things we had talked about is exit and liquidity, and um, you know what it sort of looks like strategically for um, Patagonia in the future, uh, and you know, because it is a private company and. So how how is how is the board and Yvonne, his family and others thinking about like what does it look like over the long term for um, the, the sort of perpetual? Uh, I, I and I know that the benefit corporation legal structure may play into this, but just sort of yeah. how, you're, how you're thinking about how, all that. It, it does, you know, the, the family can the family owns the company, and um, as uh, Yvonne and Melinda phase out, that their two children phase in. And one of the reasons we originally became a B, B Corp uh, was because because uh, California became a benefit corporation state in 2012. And 
we thought it was important to write our values into our articles of incorporation and our charter and to have that have legal status. Um, in the future, if, if uh, one of the family members sells Patagonia stock, we wanted whoever bought into Patagonia to have to buy into the company that we built all this time and not to simply have the right to take that name and create something uh, different, much more short-term oriented, uh, no longer in alignment with its values. And so the, the, the B Corp, um, the benefit corporation status, it yeah, provides some benefit, some some protection there. Um, it's we've also had a since becoming a B Corp other benefits that we didn't expect because it really is taking that impact assessment. We really is the 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 only really holistic view we have of our practices. Even though we we depend on others for auditing um, labor practices in factories or the uh, uh, toxicity of chemicals used in our dyes. This actually looks at everything we look at. It looks how does Patagonia behave toward its employees, toward its communities, to the environment, um, and how are we doing versus how we were doing a couple of years ago. So it's become very important to us on that level as well. And definitely as a comparison between even you know folks like Dr. Bronner's not in your industry or, and then within your industry as well. So it gives a good benchmark. Yeah, and we're not so much looking. We, you know, we, we we joke that we're yeah we're short. We want to we're, look, we're looking over our shoulder at uh, uh, who's ahead of us on the B Corp scale. But we're really what's most important to us is that comparative that comparison between our last report and our current report, and it has led us to make to put some emphasis on on areas where we were weak, um, and to make changes. An example, we we thought we were kind of, we were doing okay because we made so many products with recycled polyester as opposed to virgin polyester. But with a B Corp assessment, it said, you know, you've got to look at this by weight, not just the number of styles. And we looked at it by weight. Some of our most popular styles use virgin polyester, and it didn't. We we weren't very happy with that. So that spurred us to. Um, look uh, to change to to for more recycled to more recycled content much quicker than we would have it it would have taken us longer to realize that if we didn't have the um, the, the impact assessment to to look at got it so not physical weight but like weighting of the blend yeah you yeah. know it's not just okay we so we make 80 styles with recycled um, content but maybe 60 of those styles you sell 500 and then you know the you know the styles with the with the, with the uh, virgin polyester you're selling thousands and thousands of yeah. so that that taught us okay no we we've, we've got to look at the uh, the total amount of virgin polyester versus recycled polyester we're putting into the line. Well, I think we should maybe call it for the strategy session here. So thank you, Vincent. Okay. Maybe. Next economy now is a production of Lift Economy. Lyft is an impact consulting firm whose mission is to create, model, and share a locally self-reliant economy that works for the benefit of all life. To listen to all our past episodes or to share your thoughts about the show with us, visit www.lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. It's really very helpful in allowing these ideas to reach a wider audience. Once again, thanks for listening.